Hi guys. Okay, so we've talked about bonding. We've been studying reactions when bonds are broken and new bonds are formed, right? Barf. Um, let's take a step back and look at the different kinds of compounds we've studied, right? Um, metals, right? Uh, metallic com uh, metallics, ionic compounds, covalent polar, covalent nonpolar, and things that contain a polyatomic that are both ionic and covalent. Now, here in our, our lab, our simple lab, we can just look at the basic properties like melting point, does it dissolve in water, um, is it shiny, is it a good conductor? And these basic properties down here can help us um, identify what group the compound falls in. Right? If it has a high melting point, a white crystal, and it only conducts when it's dissolved in water, we know that's going to be an ionic compound. Okay, so we're going to be taking a look with our... Uh, our science mentor, uh, Dr. Capri Price, about infrared spectroscopy, which takes this way many steps further. So she's going to explain the details. Let me just show you an overview. So let's say you have a compound or molecule here, and you can shine a special kind of light, IR, infrared light on it, and it will wiggle or vibrate. Let's take a look. Now, one thing I want you to notice in this picture is they're wiggling or vibrating in different ways, and that's depending on their bond. And then these wiggles or vibrations are transferred into frequency peaks, which can, then can be read by a computer and compared to a database of a lot of different substances in the world that have already been entered. And when there's a match, you can identify a substance. And often this is what happens in forensic chemistry. Okay, she's going to go into more detail. And here we go. Hi, guys. I hope you're doing well and surviving 2021 so far. So as a reminder, my name is Capri, and I'm working as a science coach for Newberg for this year. And today I wanted to talk to you about infrared spectroscopy. So as a way of talking about infrared spectroscopy, I found five white powders, some from my kitchen and some from my lab, and I put them in vials. And I put them in vials several months ago when I first started doing this video, so trust me when I say I don't remember which vial contains which powder. So in this video, I'm going to use infrared spectroscopy and our infrared libraries to identify the five white powders. So what do I mean when I say infrared spectroscopy? Well, let's start with the first word, infrared. So you've probably seen an electromagnetic spectrum before. I like this diagram that I've seen floating around the internet. So we have all different kinds of light with different lengths of waves. On the short end, on the short wavelength high energy end of things, we have x-ray light which we talked about using with x-ray fluorescence and studying historical sites. Infrared light affects molecules differently than x-ray light. Instead of knocking out electrons from atoms, infrared light causes molecules to just wiggle in different ways. So we'll talk about that more in a minute. So infrared is a type of light, and spectroscopy means to study matter with light. So infrared spectroscopy is the study of matter or the interaction of matter with infrared light. So this diagram shows what happens to your sample when we place it on the infrared instrument. So we have a crystal that the sample sits on, shown here as a gray trapezoid. We can use different crystals for different purposes, but in my lab we typically use a diamond, as it is very rugged and not liable to be scratched like some other materials. Okay, so we have the sample on the crystal. Then we tell the instrument to apply infrared light to the sample. So it bounces along the crystal, making contact at the interface of the sample and the diamond. This energy causes the molecule to vibrate in different ways, which I tried to show with the animation lines on the molecules. So these are meant to be water molecules, which are very infrared active, meaning they give strong signal. So then these vibrations are detected by the instrument by the change in energy, and what's called a spectrum is produced. Basically, it's just a computer readout of what's happening. So you'll notice the vertical axis is titled absorbance and the horizontal axis is titled frequency, which is related to wavelength. 
So where you see peaks in the spectrum, the molecule has absorbed energy at that particular frequency and has used it to perform a certain vibration. It's sometimes referred to a spectrum as a map of the dance moves a particular molecule performs under infrared light. Okay, so in the previous slide, I spent some time trying to animate the water molecules myself to show the dance moves, but that was not going to happen. So I stole this GIF to show you instead. Please ignore that the word stretching is misspelled. <laughs> so this is a different molecule. The balls are meant to represent atoms, and the sticks are bonds between them. So the bonds are moving in different ways, as you see here. Okay, so we've talked about infrared spectroscopy, but what about these powders we're trying to identify? I selected five different powders. One is baking soda, which you are likely familiar with. The scientific name for that is sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate. Then we've got Tylenol with the scientific or generic name acetaminophen. You all probably haven't looked at organic structure notation, so you might not have any idea what this stick figure thing is with the different O's and N's. That's okay, it's just a way we represent different bonds and atoms in the structure. Each junction, unless there's a specific letter, is assumed to be a carbon atom. And if there's one line, it's one bond, or if there's two lines, that means two bonds. So in this molecule, there's a bunch of carbons in a hexagonal shape, and then a couple of oxygens, one with a double bond, and then one with a single bond and a hydrogen, H, and then a nitrogen and an H. Okay, so moving on to cornstarch and cellulose. These are very similar in structure. It's just a matter of which way the groups on the chain point up or down and the way in which the molecules in the chain hold hands. See how all the oxygens and the starch point down um, in between the chains and in the cellulose, they take turns pointing up and down. So I'm wondering, based on this information, do you think the recorded vibrations are going to be different or mostly the same? Lastly, we have bisphenol A or BPA. You might have heard about this on the news. It's a plasticizer or something plastic producers add to their raw materials to improve the mechanical properties of the plastic. Basically, it helps keep it from cracking, but there is some research that suggests that BPA might not be a good thing for our bodies. So here are the five white powders on a black background. Hopefully you all got a sheet of paper to write down your guesses like the one shown here. And so this is the infrared spectrometer. Not as exciting as an XRF phaser gun, maybe, but still a very useful instrument. And so this is the interior of an infrared spectrometer. This is actually of a newer IR instrument I have in the lab. I still prefer the older instrument that I showed you initially, but I only had an interior picture of the newer instrument to show you. Anyways, it is... I think just looks cool. It has a laser that we use for alignment. It has a detector, mirrors to move the infrared light around the instrument, a power supply, and then of course the IR source. Okay, so here's that tiny little diamond crystal I was telling you about. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a spectrum. So I apologize for the poor resolution here. This is an old computer that does not do a screen recording. So first we're going to take a background because actually CO2 in the room air is really infrared active. So we want to be able to subtract that out. So this is what our background looks like. We have our big CO2 peaks and some peaks for the diamond. And now we're ready to move on to taking the sample. Okay, so I'm placing the white powder onto the crystal, and then I'm putting the anvil down as that will press the sample up next to the crystal to give it good contact. Okay, so now we see our spectrum forming. I'm going to run 32 scans, which just means it's going to average 32 replicates together, and then we'll be ready to do the next sample. But I'm not gonna show you every sample because that would just be boring. So here are our five spectra from our five samples. Okay, so we're ready to start searching our spectra against the library databases. So we have access to over 250,000 reference spectra. 
Most of them come from major chemical companies, but there are a few that come from different crime labs. Okay, so sample one looks like it's a match to acetaminophen. Hopefully that structure looks familiar to you. Here's our second spectrum, which looks like it's a match to cellulose. It's got some other weird matches, like to a supplement powder. That could be because sometimes they make the capsules for powdered supplements out of cellulose. And then there's this Jillian Michaels calorie control. That hit is likely because some diet pills are made out of cellulose as it expands in the stomach and makes you feel full. Our third sample is a solid match to sodium hydrogen carbonate. Our fourth sample is a solid match to amylopectin, which is the main component of starch. You may have noticed that the cellulose sample also had some matches with starch, but they weren't as good as the cellulose. So they look very similar, but there are some differences. And our fifth sample has the same structure as BPA. They're just calling it by a different name here. Okay, so we've got our answers. Did they match your guesses? All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed play playing CSI for a little bit, and I hope you have a great rest.